everybody. Welcome to It's Not Your Money, real talk about achieving racial equity in philanthropy. These slightly irreverent but frank conversations feature leaders challenging the status quo plaguing philanthropy today and those that are demonstrating how we can build a more equitable and just funding landscape, particularly for Black, Indigenous, other people of colour, women and non-binary founders. I am Jasmine Shanslau, Senior Advisor to the Capital Collaborative by Camelback Ventures, co-author of the book Unicorns Unite, How Nonprofits and Foundations Can Build Epic Partnerships, and host today. I have the pleasure of being, enjoy, uh, of being joined by a social entrepreneur, public speaker, DEI consultant, Camelback Ventures Fellow, your Candy Valdez. Welcome, your Candy. Hello. Um, I would love for you to just tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, no, I, I, so I was born in the Dominican Republic and moved to St. Louis, Missouri at the age of 10, where there weren't a lot of Dominicans. And, you know, being an immigrant um, was a big awakening. Like literally overnight, I woke up with a new sense of blackness, with a new sense of what being poor meant. And I, I really had to grapple with that at a, at a young age and truly understand um, at that point in my life, even what access to power meant, because before that I was, you know, I was just a little girl. And now all of a sudden I had to grow up and really step up for my parents who were working low wage jobs and realizing that pop, that, that entry to power uh, being someone with broken English and curly hair wasn't going to give me that opening. And, and as you can imagine, that really impacts how you look in the world and has shaped my career, has determined what, what I'm focusing on right now. And since college, I, I've been on a journey to do my small part to help in creating equitable systems that meet the needs of communities of color, whether uh, in the workplace as a DEI consultant or uh, in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, making sure uh, founders get the funding and resources they need uh, to build a world that's truly reflected of this growing demographic. I love that, Yulkendi. And, and, and I think at the very least, we can probably say that you are doing many small bits. <laughs> to contribute because <laughs> you wear a lot of different hats and you've been involved in uh, a, a bunch of really interesting and exciting and important uh, initiatives and we'll get into some of those in a minute uh, but I want to start us off just talking about language. So regular watchers or listeners uh, of this series will know that it's called It's Not Your Money because when we incorrectly label the money in foundations and dApps as still belonging to the founders of those funds, then we also act like the money and the foundations still belong to them, which perpetuates the concentration of power. So in this situation, words are really influencing who holds power. So your candy, uh, my question for you, as with all of my guests, is what shift in language would you like to see us make that might help us diversify power? Yeah, um, I like to see language shift around the grouping that's currently being done. So uh, I'm referring to diverse founders and um, kind of this new uh, sector that's created like, oh, we do uh, diversity. Even when I mentioned my title early, I, I still hate it, don't resonate with it. But, you know, instead of saying diverse founders, let's say Black, let's say Latinx, let's say Latina, let's say Chicana, Chicana X. I'd rather folks get that wrong and we have a conversation about race and identity than being called a diverse founder. Because what I hear is other, I hear alien, I hear, uh, well, I'm not getting real money, I'm getting petty coin money, I'm getting right. petty money and not the revolutionary transformational mm -hmm. money. I really do need to make change because that language is connected to how the system is is created and 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 it will be continued to perpetuate over time and you know when i mention um 
uh, identifying with my Blackness as a Latina and now mm -hmm. being here as an Afro-Latina, there's a lot of power in my identity. So I know is intentionally being diminished. And we can see that in the U.S. census right now, like mm -hmm. literally trying to make Afro-Latinos disappear. And this is in 2023, even though there's 6 million plus of us and counting. And we know if we don't think about intersectionality, if we don't really think about identity, that impacts how money is, is distributed. Uh, so even that little word or that little hyphen on how I describe mm -hmm. myself is, is super important. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I really appreciate the reminder, Yukendi. And I think, I think often times where uh, I'll speak for myself oftentimes I try and look for you know what's what's the phrase that will capture everything so I don't leave anyone out right and so it may not be intentional at the outset but the impact is that it's then you know grouping everybody together and losing any of the individuality and uh, the responsibility that I might have to actually learn about specific circumstances, to learn about specific experiences that aren't the same across the board and um, don't mean that I can just, you know, lump a whole group of people or things uh, into one. So it seems like a simple thing, but I feel like we all just need that reminder on a regular basis. So, and, and you know, it's, I get it. Like now I'm a, uh, I'm an entrepreneur turned funder. Um, and it's, it's super easy to slip into that language because as funders, we're also raising money as well. And when we need to explain our, our work is simple terms. So it's going to happen. We're going to have those ouch pineapple yeah. moments. Hey, why are we really using this language? We are playing mm -hmm. into the game. It happens to all of us, but it's just about not yeah. getting comfortable and also talking about the why and why do we use that that language exactly exactly and and you know language is already such an imperfect tool for us to communicate ironically uh, but being able to dig dig in and have those conversations to really understand what each other is saying and and talk around the terminology so that uh, we're actually able to share knowledge to hear what each other has to say. Um, and, and that kind of links to the next question that I wanna dig into. So for anybody uh, unfamiliar with Camelback Ventures, uh, Camelback finds, funds and supports what they term undervalued entrepreneurs. And this is another grouping term. <laughs> um, so we can talk about that if you want to. But um, generally what Camelback means by the undervalued part is that black, brown, people of color, women, non-binary founders are literally, as you said, your country, literally not valued or funded to the same degree as their white male counterparts are. Like there's a separate fund for the, <laughs> the entrepreneurs that aren't white males. Um, and that's true even when the outcomes of these organizations and these leaders are equal or better. So um, I, I would love to take a moment to talk about the entrepreneur part, but also if you want to talk about the undervalued part, we can talk about that as well. Um, and at Camelback Ventures, we've had a lot of conversations about what entrepreneurship looks like, how it shows up, what it means when you really step out of the white dominant definitions and tropes of Silicon Valley. So for your Candy Valdez, what is your definition of entrepreneurship and how do you think that might be similar or different to what most people think of? Yeah, I know first, you know, as a Camelback Ventures fellow, it's been exciting to see the work uh, that the organization has done to really um, examine the definition of entrepreneurship and making sure um, it doesn't, the way we see it doesn't operate just within the white dominant culture and really stepping out and seeing what does entrepreneurship really mean for, for all. Uh, and that's what makes me so grateful to be part of, of the community now as an alumni. And the reason I 
wanted to receive funding from the camelbacks of the world is because I think our definition of entrepreneurship is also a line. Uh, for me, entrepreneurship is a form of activism. And I'm not saying mm. that to give me a pat on the back. At the end of the day, I'm never going to put founders at the same level of public servants, community organizers, and folks that are out there moving uh, and shaking the policy that affects um, us as, as Americans day in and day out. But I would say in that note, uh, what, what the commonality there is entrepreneurship is personal to me. Uh, entrepreneurship has never been just a PNL statement or a scaling a marketing strategy or just an impact framework or, or a set of or a set of metrics because that that's hard to separate when the products and services are you're building are really uh, inspired and mo motivated by your family, your friends, the communities that you grew up with that you've seen over generations become impacted uh, by systemic racism and classism and, and, all, and, all, and all the isms. So it's really hard to then get up, put on a suit, create a deck, these five-year financial projections, and then try to co-switch every day to get that funding, to get that validation from a system that you know your people weren't included in, in, in the first place. So I think there's, there's a real dichotomy there um, that, that needs to, to get explored um, a little deeper. And I, I really wish that, that that is call out more in rooms because uh, mm -hmm. then we, we know that we need to increase that check size significantly. Yeah. Because just to give you another example, and I think uh, that's just been real, again, even after, after 2020, when there was supposed to be an increase in funding to BIPOC entrepreneurs, but then you see uh, the contradicting headlines where white male, cis, cis white male founders are getting billions of dollars, really, for, for ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's like... I think the real difference there, I think for a lot of white founders, you get a lot of like lottery free money. It's like you're in a class, you know, when we used to be in classes and you're doing a social experiment and you get fake money and you get to mess up as much as you want. And then you present yeah. this amazing fun vision. Uh -huh. I mean, that uh -huh. would be cool if entrepreneurship looked like that to me, but the entrepreneurship mm -hmm. I had to partake over the years is like every cent, every quarter, every dollar counts. And every time I like misspent some money, that really mm. hurt me at the end of the day because I knew that was one less money towards impact that I wanted to that community. So the type of entrepreneurship uh, that most entrepreneurs of color li live is, is really on a pressure cooker. Um, and we're not allowed to make those same mistakes. And the minute mm. we make mistake would end up in an article and saying that's why you shouldn't invest in this that's why these right. diversity mandates are distracting we're really seeing those headlines in the last yeah. two weeks uh, as as we've seen various situations play out in the financial market so it's saddening and we should talk more about that entrepreneurship is not the same for for everybody right now right and and and, and correct me if i'm wrong but it seems like part of what you're expressing is that in order to succeed in the fundraising game that comes along with entrepreneurship of any kind, almost, um, you have to strip away what you actually feel is very core to entrepreneurship, which is the activism, the deeply personal, shaped by community and family, uh inspiration and dedication as well like the the what makes you an individual what makes you uh a, a, um uh different in wonderful ways from everybody else and instead kind of remove all the personality pollute remove all the advocacy and put it into this wonderful pitch deck <laughs> so that you look like everybody else 
<laughs> or the way that your message is presented is is very similar to everybody else. Does, does that ring true? No, a hundred percent. Um, and, and then, you know, it's like, uh, uh, then you end up in, in this, this cycle because then you try to fit in and then you say, well, your, your model is not truly yeah. in a way is it, not different, but then who, you know, who's to say that, um, right. if, as an entrepreneur, I'm the one most connected to my community and understand mm -hmm. what they need. And, and, you know, that's why I'm a big mm -hmm proponent of, of more participatory grant making. Um, mm. I, was, I was happy to be part of the, the work, the inaugural council uh, new schools venture fund that they did for, for their racial equity. And now that's continuing and mm -hmm. it's stronger than ever. It's just so powerful when you have folks that are really living experts mm -hmm. um, in coalition with 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 funders and folks that have access to the money to make those decisions together, um, and I've seen that being the most effective, and it, and and that provides a way for founders not to have to compromise who they are because right. you know they're also talking to the audience that mm -hmm. cares and lives this these issues day in and day out. And that is a perfect segue into my my, my the next topic I would love to go into with you. So. You and I met through the Capital Collaborative uh, when you actually came to share your experience and advice with the Capital Collaborators. And, and for anybody who's unfamiliar, that's all white funders in a group figuring out how to apply their own equity journeys to the funding world and essentially trying to figure out what their role is in building a more just system of capital allocation. So um, you've had a little bit of practice with this question, <laughs> um, but you know, for our audience today, what do you wish white funders knew about what fundraising is like for you as an Afro-Latina founder? Yeah, it's 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 been really difficult as I now reflect over. Um, the years spent uh, building my my first social venture. Now I'm the funder side, so I'm able to look back. And um, wow, there's been moments where I was like, "Ouch!" You know, it really hurts. I remember being um, in networking events where I was just trying to, after a long day, um, have a conversation with my peers and uh, white men would come in in the middle of the circle interrupt and uh there was one where we literally um he made us put our hands out uh to compare skin tone colors and uh i was next to someone that identify as asian um and said basically said to my asian friend um that she, she doesn't belong in black people's business because our, our 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 skin tone uh was different and it was just a moment of of, of shock i think at the time we were talking about black lives matter a lot um you know i i come from ferguson missouri where uh michael brown was shot and killed 10 minutes away from me i decided to build my company and go full time and and not go into corporate. Um, the day Alton Sterling was killed out of Baton Rouge, and uh, everyone at work with their Ivy League degrees, all they care about was making sure the the PowerPoint was formatted correctly. And that's the day I decided, like, there's no time like today, to to change the way we're going if we're really moving in in. in, in in the in the in the path to to pro progress, and so to have this man again, um, kind of instead of bringing us all together to have a genuine discussion, tearing communities of color apart, um, was a big shock, and I think that reflects a lot of the entrepreneurship journey where um, communities of color are put on to compete um, for a small bucket of money and it's this whole thing again becomes like who's the model minority and who's gonna 
show up and be that token and that example for everyone. And only those, it seems sometimes that assimilated to that white dominant culture is that the ones that got access. Um, and there were few of us that were able to get that funding being, being ourselves. Um, that person then, I, I kind of let them know how they hurt. Because at that moment, I was just in shock, but they mainly hurt uh, my friend who they questioned their identity and where they belong. And I said, you know what, you, you created harm. And they apologized. But just to, for, for, for us to just have, have to uh, be the ones to intervene where we're just trying to go about network uh, uh, you know, go about our lives after a long day gets in the way of us building. So we have these two-sided job um, yes. where, where founders trying to fundraise, we're trying to do work, but then we also have to be everyone's consult, free pro bono consultants uh, mm -hmm. and therapists as they get through their own through their own uh, through their own journey. So so that's tough. Uh, because time time is money and then you're told that you have to build fast, but yet you have to focus on all these other things uh, mm -hmm. and make sure you feel and your friends feel seen, heard and valued in every room when when that's not the case. Yeah, I, I think I've, I've, I've seen and heard uh, um, similar, not, not the same, but very, very different, but similar uh, examples of how uh, black or brown or people of color entrepreneurs um, often get exhausted on so many different levels, right? Because there's, there's the craziness of, you know, what it takes to be a leader, to start something, to run an organization, to do all the fundraising, right? That, that's one level. But then on top of that, being uh, also the person in the room who, like you said, might have to be the free educator, the free therapist, the, you know, the free uh, DEI <laughs> trainer or whatever it might be. And then on top of that as well, trying to figure out how to translate and show up in a way that allows you to do one without jeopardizing the other as well. Like it is, it, it, it's just like layers of exhausting work that we, we don't value, we rarely recognize, and we certainly don't compensate people for as well. Um, I think it's, that can be a helpful way for, um, for white funders particularly to try and understand, okay, what, why is this work harder for people of color? Um, and that's maybe one way to think about it. Um, so you can be then, then thinking kind of the flip side to that is how do you want funders to show up? Like what, what practical things could they do um, that would make your life, your work easier and better, your colleagues of color, uh, non-binary colleagues, like what might, uh, what would your advice be to white funders about how they show up? Yeah, I mean, first I want to um, say thank you for the leadership and the sponsorship of those white funders who, who are really moving the needle forward and fighting that hard bottle uh, in a system. So you know that that has been recognized, and and um, we can see it with the the communities like the collaborative um, Camelback is creating that that we are having those hard conversations. It's just now all about patience. Um, uh, cause that's just not going to happen overnight. So I just want to see more of that humility, um, and transparency and, um, and vulnerability. I, I was meeting, uh, with one of my clients yesterday and the CEO of a nonprofit. And he's like, wow. So really the solution is about me going into rooms and and admitting how much we screwed up and kind of being accountable for that and and kind of realizing that like yeah that's tough but that's that's the very first step like we can just work in hypocrisy um uh but that doesn't mean that we can also celebrate our wins along the way i think both things can exist equally 
But I think more specifically for funders, um, it's important to give uh, founders critical feedback. So many mm -hmm. times I got in the pad in the back and say, interesting project you're working on, but not genuine constructive feedback about the work. Yeah. Um, I think it's now uh, such a joy to see when funders are actually um, working with founders to help them do their due diligence and get all their documents ready. That's what needs to happen. Like if you want it done a certain way, um, mm. so they can have a better chance because yes, like, you know, the process is not going to change overnight either. Then help them like actually get someone on your staff or get an uh, expert or an advisor to actually meet with them one-on-one -on -one and go through all, um, all the due diligence, their deck, their pitch, but that fluffy feedback and then make them apply again. Yes, please apply again, only to yeah. get a no. Um, that's just, again, uh, I see it as a form of founder, uh, funder uh, gaslighting, which is a very popular yeah. word that's now everywhere, but it happens here too. Um, and, and that there's just not room for that because this is a space where we're talking about real, real societal issues and, and solutions that we need to get to. So let's just be honest. Mm -hmm. So, so folks can, can move on and spend time, uh, accordingly. Thanks for bringing that up, your candy. Cause I think this is like, uh, at least in my experience, when I was, uh, running a foundation, this is one of the hardest things for funders is to say no, thank you. Clearly, and, you know, without qualifiers and, you know, hazy platitudes, you know, that could be misconstrued for uh, you should still apply to us next year, you know, and, and I think it is, it's a, to what, what you're saying, uh, or to, to, to connect two things that I heard you say, it's another form of vulnerability that funders don't like to step into, right? To say no, and then, you know, be worried. And, and I honestly think this is most of the time, the reason funders don't give uh, fundraisers a straight answer is because they don't want to hurt their feelings, right? They, they don't want to make them feel bad. Um, but in doing that, in not saying no clearly, in not telling people why they, the funders, are not a good fit, um, it ends up causing like way more trouble and like all of these wasted hours and like energies across the sector of people not having straight conversations and not knowing where to spend their time. Right. And and to your point, obviously, this isn't the system that we want eventually, but it's going to take time <laughs> to get to recreating a new system. And in the meantime, funders have to figure out how to say what they mean and be the bad guy. Sometimes, you know, it's OK if somebody isn't happy with you for not being able to give them funds. That is part of the job. That's why you get paid to do this. Right. Um, but it's a very easy thing to to shy away from and I know because I've done it myself um and I've also tried to move past it and and really tried to build that muscle of saying no with radical candor with care for the other person um but hopefully at least at the very minimum giving them the gift of clarity that whether they should or should not spend any more time with my organization <sighs> Anyway, um, I'll get off my soapbox now. Uh, so we're coming to the end of our time uh, in conversation today, your candy. And uh, as we wrap up, I would just love to hear from you if your dreams, your ideals were realized for change in the funding world, right? And I, and I, and I think you... you you're trying to implement some of those in the work that you're doing right now as a funder. But if all funders took those steps, um, how do you think things would actually look different for communities of color? 
uh, more, more money. It's all about the dollar sign. I mean, yes. Um, <laughs> it's just sad. Like research says is actually decreasing even for women. Um, so I, I want to start actually, um, seeing a push to actually increase the, the funding dollars to, uh, women, um, and BIPOC founders, bigger check sizes. And really, I want to see a world where um, a founder doesn't have to rely on a list of uh, five to 10 potential sponsors that can say their name in the room. Because right now what happens is I was sent to go to that Latino person, Black person, and like they're like the five to 10 people everybody goes to that are very influential uh, but we need more sponsor protege relationships across difference. Um, I want for sponsors to open up, um, for funders to open up the rooms and allow those relationships to happen um, and for networking not to be exclusive. So every, uh, more and more folks can be advocating for founders of color in, in rooms that they're not. But if I have to go to only that one person that's going to help me get the check, but then that one person's being reached out by 500 other founders, we're not going to see that world. So in the future, um, I, 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 I love to see all these sponsor protege uh, relationships show up that are not about the mini me, like, oh, I'm backing them because they look like me, but no, I'm backing them because they're building something great. Um, and, and I want to be part of it. That is brilliant more rooms, more conversations, more mentors, more advocates, more money. <laughs> it's simple, people. It's simple. Um, thank you so much for your time, your Kendi. It's been a real pleasure to um, hear a little bit more about your experiences and your thoughts all about the funding world. Um, and for our viewers, if you would like to learn more about uh, many of the different things that your candy is working on uh, you can visit her at your we'll pop that in the chat for you and please do check out the capital collaborative program by camelback ventures the program helps white funders deepen their commitment and efforts to advancing racial equity and racial justice through their work in philanthropy and impact investing. And we are always accepting applications um, for our next cohort. You can find out more online at camelbackventures.org. That is everything we have time for today. Huge thank you to you, your Kendi. <laughs> and thanks so to everybody for joining us. Oh, thank you, your Kendi. <laughs> Yeah, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye.